All right. So welcome to the Scope Organic Wheat Field Day. Um, I am Laura Roser. I am one of the staff coordinators for Scope. Um, I work with all of the Scope pro uh, projects, but today we're going to be focusing on wheat. Um, first, we're going to hear a presentation from Allison Krill, our lead uh, staff uh, wheat breeder. Um, we're also going to hear from Claudia Carter, uh, the director of the California Wheat Commission, and Jared Zeistro, who's the research and education assistant from the Organic Seed Alliance. Um, we might also have uh, two of our SCOPE students on wheat in uh, the audience. Uh, Sarah and Priscilla might be here. Um, okay, I addressed our Zoom etiquette and um, yeah, at the end, we'll have an open Q&A. So if anyone has questions, you can wait until the end and we will try to get to all of them. Um, Allison, are you ready to talk or should we have everyone introduce themselves real quick? Um, I, I can just talk. We'll just move on. Okay. Uh, do you want to get see if you can get rid of the bars up there? Yeah. Okay. So every time someone joins the meeting, it pops back up. Um, but if I'm not the host, I can't share my screen. So you might be stuck with this. <laughs> okay. <we'll work> <laughs> or people just have stopped stopping, stop showing up to the meeting. meeting so, <laughs> wow, we got so many people. I'm so excited. Um, okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining us for another virtual field day. Hopefully we can be in the field, um, next year. But, uh, so this, this slide here is just everybody involved on the, on the scope wheat side of things. Um, several of us who are here are talking today. Um, so this project is, is led by Charlie Brummer, who's director of the Plant Breeding Center. Um, okay, Laura, do you want to, next slide? Yeah, uh, hold on, I'm going to pause the music. <laughs> okay. Give me one sec. Alrighty. Sorry about that. Can you go to the okay. second? No, yes. Um, there you go. Okay. So just um, our overall goals of this project is we want to identify and develop varieties specifically for organic farmers that are aimed um, more towards the artisanal, whole grain, uh, local and regional markets here in California. Um, and so we're looking at a wide range of material from very new unreleased material for the main breeding program to very old material heritage and land race varieties. Um, and then we're also developing uh, our own populations that, that are a mix of these. And another important thing we wanna do is uh, create educational material for students, for college students, and also K through 12 students um, to really uh, focusing on the healthiness of whole grains and getting more whole grains in the diet and in schools and school lunches. Um, and I think Claudia's gonna talk a little more about that. Uh, so next slide. There we go. Uh, so one of the fun things we're working on is breeding for these colored weeds, uh, which we thought would be a really cool thing for the, the schools. Um, you know, not everybody's excited about weed as we are. So we thought this would bring a little more interest. And this is, this is sort of in the very beginning um, stages of development in the breeding program. The, the original colored wheats had very poor quality. So we've been crossing them with some of our high quality lines um, to, to kind of create a better colored wheat with high quality. And so I just want to point out uh, some of the cool things we, we learned. Last year we had enough that we could do some testing in the Wheat Commission. And um, we found out what these, these uh, anthocyanins in the, in the blue wheats, they really stand out when you have an acid with it. So you can see this SDS sedimentation test, which Claudia is going to talk about. It uses lactic acid and it really brings out that color in the blue wheats. And then they did a few baking tests with a, um, just a, a, a plain plain loaf, uh, a pouliche, which is a pre-ferment, and then a sourdough. And so these two pictures, the top is the pouliche and then the bottom is the sourdough. And you can see the sourdough because of the acidity in that, uh, it really helped retain the, the blue color. So we have um, some fun baking baking trials to do with, with some sourdough blues. 
Uh, okay, so then we just have a video of, of uh, our field trials we can play. So we are here at the Russell Ranch Sustainable Agriculture Facility, which is part of UC Davis, and it's where we have our larger organic trials. Uh, this year we have two grain trials. We have a naked barley trial and a wheat trial, and both of these are USDA OREI funded uh, projects. But today we're just going to talk about the wheat project, which is part of SCOPE. Uh, the wheat trial consists of 50 varieties, and these are replicated three times in these 100 square foot plots. Uh, these are all spring types. We have a mix of hard reds and hard whites, and there's a few soft whites thrown in there as well. So 25 of these lines are elite lines or varieties that come from the main UC wheat breeding program. And these were developed by our, our wheat breeder as Walter Chikaiza. And um, all of these lines have very good yield. They have good pest weight, disease resistance, um, very good quality, and have done well under low inputs. And um, many of them seem to be doing very well out here as well. Uh, these are all available for on-farm -farm testing if, if anybody is interested in that. Uh, the other 25 are XPVP or off-patent varieties. And uh, these originally came from the gene bank. They're, they're older varieties that were developed um, you know, around the time of your Corojo, so things between like 1970s and the early 2000s. And um, they're from all over the hard wheat region of the US, not just California. So, um, you know, any, any of those states west of the Mississippi. And we've been increasing these over the past few seasons in order to have enough seed to evaluate um, last year, we evaluated them in single plots, and the wheat commission uh, was able to do a lot of quality and baking analysis on those as well. Uh, so from these data, we were able to narrow down from those 60 or 70 lines that we started with to these 25 that we're looking at this year in replication. Uh, we also narrowed those down a little further to make available um, some for on-farm testing. And uh, we look forward to hearing later on from, from Jared and um, any of the growers on how those are doing this year. And um, they're planted sort of throughout California. Uh, these, all these XPVP lines are, are free for testing. There's no restrictions. Um, we can provide you with small amounts of seed. And then the idea is that the, the growers will maintain these seeds um, for, for sharing, selling, um, whatever you'd like to do with them. Um, We take, we take a lot of different notes and measurements throughout the season. Uh, early vigor is one we take early on, and that's important for organic systems uh, because we want to identify varieties that can outcompete the weeds early on. Um, we also look for any diseases that are present this year. We haven't seen much disease. Um, it's been too hot and dry for rust. Uh, we haven't seen any, any smut, which is um, an important one for organic systems. We look at heading, uh, maturity. You can see we have, have some lines that are still green out here. Uh, these are some of those older off-patent varieties. Uh, height, we take uh, lodging notes, which we haven't seen any lodging this year either. Uh, we tend to see lodging when we get lots of water and um, some of these get really tall. Um, so, you know, we were able to evaluate drought tolerance this year because you know, you all know we're in a very bad drought season. We've had about four inches of rain out here at Russell. Uh, so we did do some irrigations. We did one early on in the season, and then we did another one around grain fill time uh, because we wanted to have some grain that we could evaluate and do quality analysis on. But this still puts us, you know, roughly 10 to 12 inches, which is still pretty, pretty far below our average here in Davis. Uh, so we are seeing you know, a lot of a lot of drought uh, stress on these plants, but we see a lot of plants that are holding up fairly well under these conditions. Um, these ones that are still green that look very healthy uh, are showing signs of drought tolerance. So it'll be interesting to see what the what the quality and yields of those look like. And all of this data, um, at least for the the non-patented varieties, will be available through the. UC Small Greens website, 
Um, and also we'll be putting out a report through the, uh, the Organic Seed Alliance and um, that'll probably also be available on the Golden State Grades website. Um, so an another thing we wanted to just show you out here real quick is the, uh, we have some increases we're doing uh, for the WE Commission um, for a really interesting study they're gonna look at, um, which Claudia can tell you more about. Uh, but we planted Sonora, which is a line that many of you may be familiar with. Um, it's very popular here in California and also in, in the Southwest. Um, it's known for its drought tolerance. And so what we have planted is um, a few passes of this, both on the um, wheat side that got irrigated, um, and then as well on our barley side, which got no irrigation. Um, and you can see actually the Sonora planted uh, under no irrigation is doing really well. Um, it looks really good. Uh, the Sonora we planted that is getting irrigated is starting to lodge and um, uh, is, uh, is much later maturing. And so, you know, that was, that's kind of an interesting thing. We have, have a lot of variation out here, a lot of varieties that uh, cover a wide range of maturities and types. So hopefully you will all be able to come out next year uh, to the field and see all this for yourself. Um, in the meantime, uh, thank you for joining us out here at Russell. All right, thanks, Allison. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, can everyone see these, I hope? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, thank you. Let me... Okay, well, good morning. I'm Claudia Carter. Um, I'm with the California Weed Commission. Um, and I'm very excited to be here with you. Um, I wish we were out there with Laura and Sarah, hi. Um, but here we are virtually. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, there are a lot of things I could talk to you about, but um, we have a short time. Um, so I'm just going to concentrate on things that will, uh, you know, will describe some of the things that Alison was talking before and very important aspects of the quality testing that we do here for the whole wheat. I also will talk to you a little bit about our school wheat project and the Golden State Greens. So first of all, not many of you might be familiar with the testing we do here at the lab, uh, but I'm just going to tell you about two tests that we are utilizing for our whole wheat testing uh, quality of the varieties that Allison has done. And a lot of it started uh, when we uh, connected with her in, in, in testing the quality for her lines. Uh, testing whole wheat flour quality is actually uh, difficult because most of the equipment that is out there for testing wheat uh, quality is mainly for white flour. So the most common ones being farinograph, you also have algograph, and then also there is this one called mixograph that is mostly used by, uh, by breeders, so for developing new lines. Um, so after we, we tested on these equipments, we decided the mixograph was the best one to tell us more information about the quality of the lines uh, without you know, actually seeing differences in the varieties. Um, so we also had to adjust it. And what we did is normally you have the flour plus the water, you mix it into this small mixing bowl, and then uh, it actually gets a curve like the one is here. And then with that, we can get whatever values we're deciding to take out of that curve. But we also added 2% of salt. And the reason why we did that is because we wanted to help and give it a boost to the wheat itself, keeping it all at 2% um, as our standard method. So we could see differences and that really helped. So what we got here is only one value that we think is very important. It's called the envelope tail integral. And what that is, is actually all the area on the curve, as you can see what it's shaded there. So once we tested all Allison's lines for two years, um, and I, I believe we're entering the third year, 
Um, Alison, you can correct me on that. But what we have done, at least for those, the data set that we uh, tested was get a variety of qualities. And so we can see the lower end and the higher end. With that, we created ranges. And this was done uh, by Tamben um, in collaboration with Alejandra and myself in looking at how can this be co co correlated with the baking data, which usually is very difficult. So what we did is got a range uh, for the different values. So if you have an ETI of less than 134, then you only have an ETI score of one, meaning that's the lowest. So that will be a, a variety that has a lower protein quality. And then the higher one will be five, which is a higher of 100, uh, le more than 190. So now another test we're utilizing for these is a micro sedimentation test. And the micro sedimentation test is a super quick test um, that, that also breeders utilize. So it can be run in multiple samples. Um, and so what it is, is that takes the ground whole wheat flour and you mix it with a solution that has lactic acid and another, uh, another component called SDS. And what really this in a simplified version to explain to you is that that uh, solution binds to the flour itself and binds to the protein, the gluten forming proteins, the gliadins and the glutenins. When they bind, they actually swell, just kind of like a sponge. So what we're doing here, as you can see on this, that we have a variety of lines with the differences in quality. Um, and then we measure the height on how much is swell. So for example, we have the highest one with the first one and one in the middle that got uh, of five centimeters, which equals to 50 millimeters. And that's how we actually um, provide this value. But then also you have the other side of a variety that had only 20 mm, which is the lower end. Now that's not, uh, that's not uh, bad, it's just that it has a lower protein quality. And we want to be able to give another, again, a range that can help us to give a score, very much simplify it. So if we had a, um, a sedimentation of less than 25 for a variety, we actually don't give it any score. So we, we say, no, there's just not, um, it's not a, a high quality protein. So we just give it zero. And then uh, with the higher than 50, for example, we get a score of five, which is the highest score. So now what we did is we add those two scores up. We do the ETI score plus the sedimentation score, and then we get our overall uh, score. So then with that, we classify it. And this is, again, we get one score that could be easily described to a grower. It could easily describe the quality to a breeder or a baker. So we want to make it simple as possible without compromising the actual quality that is telling us with this test. So then I always say that there is no bad wheat. It's just it's a wheat that hasn't found a home. And when I say that, I mean a home for a product. So if you have a low uh, uh, quality protein, that means that is more suitable for as a pastry flour, for example. Whereas if you have in the medium range of a score of four to seven, that's better for flatbreads and artisan breads, for example. And then the higher one is more of a stronger type of gluten then that's more suitable for bread pizza, but also could be used for blending uh, as a blending wheat. So with that, I wanna tell you just a few examples of the on-farm trial wheats that we're doing with Allison and Jared and how we're looking at the, at the, at the quality. So here I wanna to mention to you protein content. It's the only time that I'm going to mention to you protein content because we are not putting that as part of our quality. The reason being is that uh, you know, the protein content is just a number that can tell you, uh, you know, what's the percentage of the protein in that wheat. However, we know that that doesn't tell you anything about the quality. So that's why we do not, uh, when we talk about quality of the protein, we don't add that up to the scoring system. But here you can see a variety called Baker and the other one, Norm, that is a 10.5 uh, equally. It has the same overall score. And the bread baking, once we bread it with a straight dough method, it's a yeasted bread, 100% whole wheat, uh, we were able to measure the volume. So we got 910 for baker and 760. Now you were, you probably are wondering, they look pretty similar in quality and in protein, what's the difference? So the difference between these two varieties is actually the baker came with a falling number of 250, which is enzymatic activity saying that it's a lower enzymatic um, I'm sorry, high enzymatic activity. So there is a lot of that amylase activity. 
whereas the norm had 420 folding number. So by not having much enzymatic activity, there is not much of that breaking down of the sugars from the starch, that is the food that it provides to create the fermentation process so it can get um, you know, the gas developed and then the low volume can stretch. So that's an important aspect of the wheat that we also need to consider uh, for quality. So then we have these other three varieties here, Admire, Fergus, and 775. Here you have a much variety, more variety in quality. You have an overall score of seven being high, you have a three and you have a five. So the Fergus at three, which will be considered low, uh, it still provided a very good uh, significant uh, you know, quality that 770 for a low volume is still acceptable. So it could actually, it's a borderline between, yes, you could still use it for artisan bread, um, and you can ask, actually use it for something that are, are more like pastry flour if you wanted to. So the, we also, what we have been doing here is adding flavor profiles. As you can see on the bottom of my breads, we have Admire giving fruity and sweet uh, uh, flavors. Fergus had warm spice flavors, and then the 775 had more of molasses as a flavor. So finally, I wanna hear, um, my second part of my conversation to you today is actually the Dingo Elementary School project that we started doing um, three years ago. And what has what it's, it is is that we help the schools growing the wheat, we help them harvest it, and we help them process it. And then we have brought the students here to do some um, some uh, hands-on uh, quality testing so they can get exposed to what we do as cereal scientists, as a baker, um, and so forth. So thanks to that, we were able to apply to a grant um, through the CDFA and we receive about 145,000 to bring this project to other schools, but actually to help them to establish a mill, uh, to buy two, two past extruders, and then so they can produce their own flour and produce their own products to serve to the students. But also we will be creating curriculum for the students to learn what it is to grow wheat, what it is to process it, and what it is to make something out of whole wheat. We're doing it in collaboration with uh, Grissom Toll, uh, with UC Davis, the SCOPE project as well. Finally, uh, Golden State Greens is a website that was developed for you guys uh, who are out there trying to find wheat, for example. It was developed for our farmers who have been developing uh, growing wheat or other grains, and they would like to uh, set up a profile so end users can find them. So this is a connecting web tool. So I encourage you to uh, let me know if you would like to be added in there as a farmer, as a miller, as a maltzer, um, just send me an email. So thank you so much for listening. My email is right here. I will put it on the chat room. I do wanna thank Laura, Sarah and Allison and everyone else and Jared for making this work. And I hope next year we can all be at the field just like those sweet uh, friends that are out there celebrating. So thank you so much. And I will answer any questions later on. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you. All right, you ready, Jared? I am, yep. I'm just calling up my PowerPoint right now. Let's see. Um, let me see. Um, share PowerPoint. Um, sorry, one second. Let's see. Do a new share. For some reason it's not showing me the PowerPoint that I wanted to show you. Um, I think right now it's sharing your whole screen. Yeah, let me see one second. So to Zoom, I thought I had this all worked out perfectly. Um, I stopped sharing, make sure I, there it is. Okay. And then, uh, let me, I'm sorry, it's not showing me as an option on my share screen. Um, let me, See if I can solve this. Usually it just pops right up as one of the options of things I can share. Let's see. Let's try again. 
All right, there we go. OK, you all can see this? Yes. OK, great. Um, so uh, as uh, Laura mentioned, my name is Jared Zeistro. I work for Organic Seed Alliance, and we are a nonprofit that helps farmers find the seeds that they need to be able to succeed for um, being able to grow successfully um, and um, be able to um, find varieties that do well for their farms, allow them to use less inputs. And I'm really excited to be able to participate in this wheat project. I think that it's been really important work and it's been really a pleasure to work with everyone at UC Davis and at the California Wheat Commission. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the trials that Allison alluded to of these off patent spring wheat varieties. I wanted to start off just briefly, um, why are we testing, um, increasing seed of, doing these trials of off patent varieties? Part of this comes from conversations that we've heard for a while from organic growers of, they're, 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 first off, there's a real use and value to PVP, plant variety protection, to be able to provide some security for seed companies to provide incentive for plant breeders to develop variety, new varieties, provide security for seed companies to carry those varieties. One of the challenges though for a lot of organic growers is that the varieties that may work well for them may not necessarily be the ones that do the best for larger scale conventional production and so much of the variety development and uh, sales and maintenance system is geared towards the varieties that do well for large conventional systems. And so what can happen is that, especially with small grains, varieties, new varieties are developed and older varieties are often dropped um, on a relatively rapid basis. You know, this is known as variety churn. And if in addition to having plant variety protection on the varieties, they also have a plant back restriction, meaning the farmers can't save and plant back seed from those varieties. Um, if those varieties are no longer in the marketplace, now organic growers have to go out and try and find something else that can work and substitute. The nice thing about something that isn't patented for organic growers for specialty, uh, for growers for specialty markets or in unusual smaller regions is that if they do find something that works well and they have the capacity to save their own seed, now they are reducing their risk and increasing their security by being able to maintain that variety themselves. Unfortunately, there are you know, relatively few options for non-proprietary varieties. There are you know, a handful of heirloom varieties that are you know, passed around um, you know, informally farmer to farmer or you know, available in relatively small quantities and, um, but for more kind of modern varieties, the, there, there isn't a lot of options. So that was, this work was in part, you know, done to try and address some of those challenges. Uh, as Allison had said, these kind of all started with about, it was about 80 accessions, a little less than 80 accessions that were retrieved from the USDA germplasm repository information network. And I just point this out to anyone that's interested. I mean, these were all spring wheats, but the germ, and these were all these XPVP varieties. The germplasm repository network has just a huge volume of varieties of wheat in particular, other small grains and other crops in general that are available for testing and trialing. If you, if, if you can provide kind of a legitimate research purpose, which would include testing varieties for on-farm use, most of the time the USDA is happy to send you seed to test. So um, I would encourage you, and I can put a link in the chat, there's a, there's a great presentation on how to navigate the USDA germplasm um, website and how to identify and request accessions from them. And I would, if, if you're interested, check that out. Of these, as Allison said, the, the USDA only will send you, I, I think about five grams of seeds, so less than a hundred seeds. So the UC Davis Small Grains Program did increases on them and also observed them during that increasing process. And thanks to those observations was able to narrow that down to 
about 16 of those that were seemed to be the most promising for on-farm trials. And these are the, the varieties here. And you've already seen a little bit of information, both from Allison and then from Claudia on the quality side in terms of these. You can see that they're almost all hard red springs with the exception there of World Seeds 13 as a soft white spring. And thanks to the observations that Allison did, you know, have some sense of quality and maturity and yield, at least in the growing environments they're tested. The, these varieties were made available for uh, growers throughout the state to be able to test on their own sites. And the way that this was set up was basically growers could choose sort of a menu of those varieties. They didn't have to grow all of them. They could just grow a subset that they thought seemed the most interesting to them. But then we used Pat 515 and Yacora Rojo as check varieties. So everybody also is growing those. And then they're, they grew all of the experimental off patent varieties as just a single replication, meaning just grown once in the field with the check varieties grown twice. And that just allows us to kind of compare between the sites since they're being grown all over California and not everybody's growing the same experimental varieties. These were grown in 10 foot four row plots and we um, hot water treated the seed, meaning that the, all the seed went into a hot water bath for a specified time and temperature to reduce the risk of one of the concerns with trials like this, bringing seeds, experimental seed onto your farm is concerns around seedborne disease, um, uh, smut and bunt in particular, and the hot water treatment is designed to help reduce the risk of that happening, as well as um, the fact that these seeds were grown in, a, in plots that were observed to be free of disease the, the previous year. So these were grown, they were planted you know, between last fall and this spring. It sites kind of all throughout California. Here's a map of where those sites are and growers selected between two and 16 of the experimental varieties as well as those two check varieties. Right now, the only the earliest of the plantings, the November plantings, I've heard um, kind of more information from. Um, we know one of the plantings that uh, because of the drought year, unfortunately, it was not successful. Um, and some of the other ones are still you know, actively growing, but we don't have any real information back from them. But here's a little bit of, kind of some early reports that we've got back from the folks that planted in November. So this is from School Road Farm over in Gilroy. They planted November 12th and they grew the 775 Norm Baker Admire DK22S and World Seed 1809. Some of their early observations they haven't harvested yet. So this is things that they could observe in the field was that the 775 were the earliest and the Norm and the DK22S were the latest. But in general, they are all relatively clustered together in terms of maturity and um, one of the things that's interesting is they also were trialing varieties from the bread lab uh, at WSU, and all these varieties were much earlier than the WSU material, which is on the sides of these plots, and that was seen as a pretty good advantage, especially, you know, in these kind of drought conditions to be able to, you know, mature more quickly and, you know, get it out of the field before things dried down too much. The norm was the tallest and the 775 was the shortest. And in terms of problems that were observed, the only problems that were observed was the World Seed 1809 uh, had pretty severe lodging and the 775 um, had some amount of rust, but relatively little. Otherwise the plots were looking clean. The other site that reported back from a November planting was the Cal Poly Student Farm in San Luis Obispo. So they planted November 19th and they were they only grew um, two of the entries. They grew Admire and World Seed six in addition to the Czech varieties and all of them they reported back were looking good. They did um, and kind of I would take this with a big grain of salt. They they did an early harvest of some subsamples of the plots. So before everything was fully um, matured and dried down, 
and they found that um, from those early subsamples that the um, experimental entries were not were yielding only about half as much as the, the two check varieties. But again, that's before things were dried down or fully filled out. So, um, you know, that I would say is interesting, but I want to see once their volume mature and harvested what the real data is. Hopefully we'll be hearing back more from the rest of the growers as the season continues, getting yield data and then working in collaboration with the wheat lab to be able to um, do some quality testing on some of these to get a sense of how these varieties perform throughout the state. And also as Allison alluded to, you know, see which ones really have some potential for adoption because if they, if any of these growers are excited about them, they now have a larger um, amount of, you know, seed that they can use as stock seed for a larger planting the following year and kind of creates an organic way to get some of these varieties out into distribution informally between farmers. I would say that if anyone's interested in testing these varieties this coming season, we'll be doing this again um, in, uh, you know, for the you know fall spring planting, fall winter spring planting this um, coming year. So let me know. And of course, once we get the full set of data from these trials, we'll put that together, you know, along with kind of those comparisons that we're able to make between sites based on the um, control varieties. And we'll have that out there and that will be, you know, just that much more useful for anyone that does want to do trials this coming year to see, you know, how well each of the varieties did. Um, and if, you know, any of them were grown in an area close to, close to you, um, you know, you can see if, uh, you know, which varieties did well, um, you know, in a similar environment. So let me know, Jared at seedalliance.org, if you're interested. Now I'd like to um, close my slideshow and open this up for questions, I think, for, for all the presenters. Thank you, Jared. Um, yeah, now it's time for our q and I think we have a question for you from Nicholas Williams. Why were Patwin and Yakora Rojo selected as the check slash control varieties? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think probably all of us could, could speak to that, but the, the, the goal was those two have been grown you know, so extensively throughout the state and have been part of the small grains testing program for a while that um, that allowed, you know, since they were kind of known quantities, it just made it that much easier to compare these new experimental varieties, um, you know, based on kind of those, those baselines that we have in terms of those existing data sets. I also want to add, we wanted to add, we wanted a white and a red in there. I would like to say that uh, there's a new Yekara Rojo now that has the, the YR5 and YR15 genes for stripe rust resistance. So if you need a Yekara Rojo that is resistant to stripe rust, uh, you can use that one instead of the old Yekara Rojo. And we are testing that one in the, in the organic trial, so we can make that data available. All right, we have another question um, from Jason, wondering if it's possible to test varieties from Europe. Yes, we actually have some um, varieties from David Kaisel, some Italian varieties we've, we've been looking at a bit. So um, that is a possibility. So just yeah, contact us if you have the seed or you know we need to get from the gene bank, we can, we can include those. Yeah, Allison, would you be able to throw your email into the chat? So yeah. if you have any varieties that you would like us to test out, you can email Allison or, I mean, any of us, and we will let you know if that's possible. Um, we have another question from Karen in the opposite direction. Is it possible for me to try to test these varieties in India? And secondly, uh, where can I send my current wheat samples to for testing? Um, well, Claudia can provide you the, I think she already put her, the address of the week mission in the, in the chat. Um, uh, you can probably test them in India. I think the best way to do that though would be just to order from the gene bank yourself. I'm not, um, it's been difficult to, to send seed over, 
overseas lately. So, um, but we can we can look into that. Interesting. You need to get an import permit and a phytosanitary from APHIS if you want to send seeds to other countries. But we have sent seeds to India, so. Okay, I have another question uh, from Nicholas. Also, was there direction given to the various trial growers about watering regimes? So the, the plan with this trial was really to have growers use their normal practices. So in terms of planting time, in terms of fertility, um, in terms of watering. Uh, so there was a mix of, you know, just strictly, you know, rain fed versus some irrigated. I think the only, the only person I provided direction to was at San Luis Obispo because it was a, a student farm and they had lots of questions because they were new to it. So, um, but otherwise, um, you know, really it was, you know, folks that had experience growing grain and we wanted them to match their systems to see how well they did in their systems. They're, they've, they're all recording that information. So like, what was the prior crop? What kind of fertility? What was your irrigation, um, you know, as well as your location? So we'll have that kind of as metadata to go with each of the sites. Yeah, and I will say we make all efforts with our scope trials to have them be completely rain fed. Although this year it was just not possible because the rain was just so little. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I think I have a question from David, which I think was uh, DM to me, but I think it's for the group. Um, has anyone been testing or developing populations? Um, let me just copy paste it. I do not know how to pronounce these. Such as uh, Wakelands or the populations that Salvatore uh, has been developing. Not that, not that I know of in the US. Um, it's pretty popular in Europe for their varieties. They're, they have a population variety that they use. Right, like yeah, are, there, those are, are those like the, the sort of male sterile mega mixes and things like that? No, those are more like the Italian varieties, kind of like what um, Julie was studying and the French varieties um, that are populations they, they save and sort of each farmer, each homestead has their own population of these. Okay, I have um, another question from Bonnie regarding the grant for the pasta programs in schools. Was that, was that the local food promotion grant with the USDA or a different grant? Yeah, Claudia, could you tell us more about your new grant? Yeah, um, yeah, no, that, that's through uh, CDFA, the California Department of Food and Ag, and that's called the Farm to School Grant Program. It's, it's a fairly new program. Last year was the first year that they had um, allocations of funds for that. And I believe they are, um, you know, governor is either has approved or has sent that to be approved for the new budget to have that Farm to School continuing uh, for another year. So, uh, so if that's the case, um, I will certainly, um, you know, encourage either farmers, um, if you are a baker, if you are a miller that would like to partner up to, uh, you know, send an application for this new set of grants to do so, because with these grants, what they do or what they want us to do is have a school that partners with producers but also the regional partners. So we are kind of in between where the regional partner, the California uh, Wheat Commission. So then, uh, so, you know, there could be other entities and nonprofit organizations as well that could apply. Um, and the, and the, basically what they want to do with this is help local farmers um, support more schools with the products that are being produced locally. Uh, unfortunately for weed, it, it is really hard for us because 
they are not local, you know, they're not that many regional grain processings and mills that can support a larger school district, for example, in Los Angeles or San Francisco. And when I say that, I also say that uh, not providing whole grain flours. And that was the case for us that we want to do is, it's a very small scale, pilot scale program, but I think what we're trying to send is a message that we can actually organize, we can partner with the farmers. We have three farmers that are part of our grant that we need these set of a structure or infrastructure so our farmers can actually benefit from these grants. So if you want anybody who wants to talk to me more about that or needs assistance for us to even help you put a grant together, we can help you out. We did it for the very first time and we did not know what we were doing. Um, so we'll be so happy to help you. If your goal is to bring more locally produced grains and whole grain products to schools, um, I'll be so happy to help you. Yeah, and I think we have lots of students who are looking for grant writing experience as well. <laughs> yeah, thanks to uh, a student from UC Davis, actually, we were able to do this because she helped me to write this grant. I do not do it by myself. Thank you. Okay, another question for Claudia. Uh, are you also interested in providing services for quality tests such as proteins of other grains or of other grain species such as beans? Um, I guess yeah. they're different categories, but tell us about your protein quality testing. Yeah, we do. We do have certain testing that we, we do gluten-free flours. We do uh, protein uh, in, in, you know, in our, in our um, leco combustion machine. So depending what you want to test it and, and, and what the application it is, we could potentially do that as well. You can unmute yourself if you want to uh, talk and, and ask questions. That's fine. Yeah, I think we've gotten through everyone's immediate questions. So we can open it up for live voice, voice questions. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a question if it's OK to jump in. Yeah. Um, uh, it's uh, for Jared specifically around the uh, those XPVP variety trials. Um, probably just to reiterate, if I had missed it, but what are what are the main goals of um, of these trials with that uh, material? Is it to is it to be creating varieties that are better suited for organic conditions? Or I would say there's there's there, there's two steps. I mean, one is just the simple screening of existing you know these existing varieties. So you know, to see if there's immediate potential. I mean, all of these were, you know, you know, received a, a patent at some point, received a PVP at some point. So they're, you know, they had commercial value, um, you know, at, you know, one point in time. So they're, you know, not, we're not starting from scratch there, um, but finding things, you know, screening through that in an environment they weren't necessarily tested in originally to see if any of them kind of all right out of the gate can be useful and then you know can be increased and maintained hey. you know, by farmers how you doing um, but the, Good. I'm right. um the other but then but then i think secondarily and i mean i'll you know can see what allison says about this but the you know i think that you know there's a you know one of the nice things about a trial like this is it also kind of gives us information about if any of these might be have value as parent lines to develop new crosses um, for, you know, that, that, you know, where the parents have been identified as being adapted to, you know, organic farms in California. So that would be kind of step two. Yeah, right. And so we do plan on, um, you know, using some of these as parents. So for existence, the one that uh, what was a 775 was uh, susceptible to rust. Uh, so in the, in the main breeding program, we do have genes we can incorporate that are resistant to rust. So similar to what, um, has been done with your Kuro Rojo, which is susceptible to rust as well. But so now we have your Kuro Rojo 515, which adds uh, two rust resistant genes in there. So that's something we, we plan on uh, doing for those sort of lines of interest. Great. Um, and just a quick follow up question. Um, yes, yeah, it was in the slides that, you know, they were uh, sort of farmer selected varieties, right, to be using in these trials? 
the ones that they felt were right yeah ones. yeah yeah so i mean kind of i mean the initial screening and i think that i mean it's entirely possible that the coming year with more information um some of these might you know be be dropped from offering and you know some of those other out of that original 78 um that were acquired and increased from the usda will be you know made available but you know those those, those you know the 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 16 varieties got you know narrowed down based on you know the observations made at davis but then those 16 um you know thanks to you know laura allison and you know some of the other davis students and claudia you know they provided a really nice summary of kind of the the strengths and weaknesses of those varieties in terms of you know their yield in terms of their quality um and then it was up to the farmers to see um, which ones they wanted to test this year. They could test all of them or they could, you know, just test one or two of them. So, you know, that was kind of the first filter. And then, you know, we'll see how they perform on the farm is, you know, kind of will let us know, you know, some of the, like I said, if some, you know, get dropped from testing, other ones get added in. Okay. So the, the, then they were, there was a stage where they were brought to the, um, to like farmers to be testing for themselves under their usual regimes? That's what's happening right now. Okay, excellent. Um, so we'll, we'll most likely have a sort of a different set this year. Um, we have a lot more quality data on it. We have a lot more observational data in the field. Okay, great. Um, I won't take up any more time. Just I do, uh, I'm doing my master's research right now on, particip on participatory wheat breeding in Canada. So I'll probably be following up with uh, you both by email just to probably field some more questions, but thank you. Great, look forward to it. One thing I wanted to mention, and can you guys hear me? Cause I don't understand this computer. Yeah, <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> My wife got me set up. Uh, I wanted to find out as a farmer and a miller both, um, is any of these types, I know we're talking about each strain of these these grains, um, I I noticed that one of the most popular things that we're doing as farmers and millers is that we're we're taking say the best grain that that uh, different grains that that produce different qualities and we put them together and plant them at the same plot. So so say you you want ten percent quality of this and you want fifty percent quality of this and thirty percent quality of this. We're combining those. And planting them to where when we're coming out with the combine, we're we're pulling into the mill already mixed those grains instead of doing it afterwards. Um, more of a controlled environment. I we I don't do dry land, but it, that's a tough one to go up here. But um, I'm kind of curious on any of these weeks that you're you're promoting or or testing are putting finding which ones are close or which ones might have a different um, character to add them together to find out the quality when it goes into quality testing and to say Claudia and Claudia's team. Yeah, that was something we were curious in looking at last year. We, we due to a planting area, we did have some, some mixed plots and we, you know, we're like, this is, would be interesting to look at the quality of these mixed together. And that's similar to what David was talking about with those um, Italian populations that uh, looking at mixtures to see, it's not something we've been looking at, but it, it's very interesting thing um, that we could. I think it's becoming more popular. So instead of looking at one strain or one type, one, one, one brand of wheat, mm -hmm. I noticed even, not even in the, just the state of California, but other states are, are are growing their own. So as a miller, I can have my own mix of those grains. And when, so when you get my flour and you're, you're, you're gonna get a particular, you know, smell, flavor, taste and all that. And I think that's gonna be a growing need in this, in this industry to be specific. So, and also I wanted to do a, a shout out for Claudia because I let her know that her curriculum is beginning to get into the classrooms in front of teachers in uh, Lassen County. So her team has done very well on, on, on getting that out, so. Thank you, Tom, appreciate it. I'm glad you're using that. We are getting, we're getting up and doing a lot more curriculum for, for students and for, um, 
for teaching that. And, and outdoor classrooms are indoor classrooms. So we, we can certainly share all of those resources with more people um, as they become available. So thank you so much. Oh, I just wanted to shout out one of our students that just joined, Sarah. Can you say hi? Hey, everyone. Better late than never. <laughs> I'm one of the uh, student wheat breeders on the SCOPE team. And um, I just submitted my thesis to my PI, who's also in this meeting. <laughs> Yay, Sarah. Oh, yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah, and so for anybody who's curious, yes, I do work. I work on wheat genetics and breeding for research, and I work very closely with all these lovely ladies to uh, improve plant breeding education um, with a special focus on wheat. Yeah, can everyone just send like a heart or a congratulations to Sarah? It's so exciting that you're finishing up. Thanks, Laura. Thanks. Um, we have a, just a minute or two left. Does anyone have any last questions? Or praise for any of our great speakers? I'll say that I appreciate the, the work that's put into uh, designing these, these trains and, and uh, uh, finding finding these particular types of wheat and keeping this going. Uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot way more to go. I know I was talking to a young man that uh, is doing for the triticale, and I know he's not quite there yet. I'm excited about that, but more of the commercial range. Uh, you know, that adding to other quality of flowers and stuff. So this stuff needs to be had to uh, to grow the industry by by far for sure. And uh, I appreciate everybody's um, visions in the group. Thank you, Tom. Any other comments or questions? I would make I would make one comment that um, it was made the comment of the, of the PVP varieties that the money goes to industry. But if uh, you use the public varieties that are also PVP. Actually, the, the royalties and the research fees go back to our program. So part of our program is financed by the California Wheat Commission, but other part is financed directly by the royalties we receive from the varieties we release. So actually using public varieties that are PVP, you are helping the research, our research program. Thank you. Right, yeah, sorry if I, I didn't make that clear. I, think I, I might have said breeders, but yeah, public and private breeders and certainly the an important funding stream for public breeding programs. All right. Well, thanks everyone for showing up today. Um, yeah, thank you to our speakers. This is a great presentation. I loved hearing from everyone. And yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I hope we yeah. get some next year. I hope we get some rain next year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alison, for putting this together. Thank you, Claudia. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. Bye, bye everyone.